and once upon a time I might have been a student here. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is project management past and future. What are we doing in project management now and where are we going to go? What sort of changes do we need to make? And the logo here is the International Centre for Complex Project Management. This is an organisation that's been established in, it started off in Australia, to look specifically at complexity in projects. There was an issue with large defence projects in Australia that were going wrong. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Big projects, government projects going astray. And there was someone in Australia who came up with some thinking about it, that we needed perhaps new ways of dealing with complexity. And this body is the result of the thinking from that. One of the things I do is actually to teach in Australia for courses that are being provided on, on this, this programme. So the ICCPM, it has an interesting website and it's worthwhile having a look at. So who am I? I well, I'm a board member of the ICCPM. I teach on the Executive MBA in Complex Project Management for the Queensland University of Technology. I'm a board member for the Association for Project Management here in the UK. Uh, I also teach at Schema, which is a French business school. I teach in Lille and in Paris. And I work at the University of Middlesex and the University of Hertfordshire. The important thing about me is that when I'm talking about project management, I'm talking about something that I've been there and done that. Because I haven't just been an academic. My academic activities are relatively recent. I started off and I learned what I learned about project management because I've been over 30 years in aerospace and defence. I said that to a group one day and, and somebody looked at me and said, I don't believe it for a minute. <laughs> Why is that? I said, well, you don't look as though you've ever had anything to do with nuclear submarines. Well, I have. Yeah? <coughs> I've been involved with the astute submarine. I started my life in avionics, working on the tornado aircraft. And I've been across a whole range of different things and since I came out of that business I've been doing work on other projects <coughs> in other domains which leads me to one of the things that I think is important which is as a project manager you have a set of portable skills you can take your project management skills and apply them anywhere I've proved that because you know having been in aerospace and defense since I've worked on railway trains I've worked in buildings I worked in the finance industry. I had a very interesting project they asked me to do a, a project history on. It was a finance company and they were introducing something like premium bonds. You know what premium bonds are in the way you put your money in and you get a bond and every month you get a prize. Well, they were introducing premium bonds in the country in the Middle East and it had to be subject to Sharia law with all the special requirements for Islamic finance. So that was an interesting exercise. So from being a project manager in aerospace to being a project manager anywhere else, once you've got the skill set, I think you can use them anywhere. I started off not as a project manager. My first degree was one of systems engineering. And I still think like a systems engineer. I still believe that in complexity, in complex projects, systems thinking is an important skill. You need the ability to take a helicopter view. You need to have the ability to look at where you want to go with your project. So that's where I started from. Um, I worked for a company called GC Marconi when I first started. And when I was foolish enough to put my head above the parapet and say, I think that we're not managing our projects properly, they said, all right, then what are you going to do about it? So I came up with a lot of thinking we're talking about 25 years ago, about how projects should be managed, how they should be worked. And so, as a consequence, whenever a project went wrong, and at that time we had an awful lot of projects that were going wrong, I used to get a tap on the shoulder from the chief executive, and he'd say, will you go and find out what's going on? What do we need to do to sort this project out? So, I haven't just worked on projects that went nicely and were good. I've had to get stuck into projects where things have been very wrong. And so I came up with a list of ideas that I have about what makes projects go wrong, what 
what makes them go right. I was also a former Vice President of the International Project Management Association and that was me on a better day. <laughs> right, something else, I'm still a project practitioner. I still think it's important for me to go off and get involved with people's projects, even if it's nothing huge. Uh, I live in Kent, we have a, a local music school. I had a call from the director of the music school that said, Mary, we have a project, we've got an awful lot of problems with it. Um, we want, we've got somebody who's writing some software for us. We're having a new system to manage our teachers, because they, the teachers move around. And I don't know what's happening. Come and help. That was a lovely job to do. It wasn't hard to solve. They actually started a project without knowing what it was they were going to do. I said to him, I said, what are you trying to do with this? Well, uh, 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 uh. I said, so, have you written anything down? No. So this software that these people are writing, where's that coming from? Oh, he said, well, they, they know what they're doing. I said, but they obviously don't because they can't tell you what they're doing. And this was the difficulty. They started this project without actually knowing what the customer wanted who was going to use it. They had two enthusiastic people writing software, but they didn't consult anybody who was going to use the software afterwards, who was going to use the system. No wonder they were lost. So I'm still a project practitioner, and I'm still an engineer. And for me, I think that project and program management is the most exciting place to be at the moment. I still get excited. I'm still happy to get up and go on and do my work. My family sometimes say to me things like, Mum, don't you think it's time you got a life? <laughs> well, I think I have a life. I really enjoy what I do. And I, if I can get you to understand some of this excitement, then hopefully it'll be, a, be an afternoon well spent. How long are you prepared to stay, by the way? <coughs> I mean, I, well, yeah, I, th I thought sort of round eight o'clock might do. Is that okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right, let's do this seriously. If, if I start off by telling you a story, and I look back to where I was when, we first, when I first started as a project manager. It was over 30 years ago. And at that time, you didn't find PCs on every desk. Nobody had PCs. We used to have this huge mainframe down in the basement that lived in an air-conditioned room. And we had to send it messages by getting a load of ladies to fill in to do punch tape. It was very useful was that because when you had a wedding to celebrate we didn't have to buy confetti, we had all the bits that had come out of the punch tape. <laughs> but we had to send we couldn't communicate. We didn't have a keyboard. We had to punch tape and put all our information in there. So if you were running a project and we would be collecting the data about the project we would need to put that data onto sheets of paper, the ladies would code it, it would then go in, the machine would grind away, and about four weeks later, two porters would come along with a big trolley, lugging this stuff, mountains of paper on it. That was our, those were our reports. Now just think what we've got now. We can get reports on PCs, it's really easy. We have SAP in a lot of organizations to provide information. You get the information almost instantly. But it took us about six weeks. So we're always looking backwards on our projects. That was really hard. No one had any time to plow their way through this paper. You know, it, it was just horrendous. And the only thing that we did understand was we knew what we meant by networks. We knew how activities fitted together. We did our networks, not with Microsoft Project or of error or any of the tools that you have now, we used bits of string, pieces of paper and pins, and we had a chart on the wall, and we used to put the bits of paper with as a, as a long strip was an activity, and then we had a, a link to it. It was wonderful fun. At that time, my daughter was quite small, and I came to the conclusion it was more fun than play school. Every month, we had to reconstruct this chart. But it wasn't very good, but it did help us to understand the concepts of dependencies and how activities fit together. And as a project manager, you were focused on three things. 
these three things are still important to us, and I'll talk to you in a minute about why, but it's this famous iron triangle. Some people called it the golden triangle, and then they decided to, talk, to use the term the golden triangle to signify three cities in India, Delhi, Jaipur, and Agra, that make a very nice tour, and that was called the Golden Triangle, because you can see all the historic sites of India there. Mm. So this Iron Triangle is the one for project management. It consists, consists of the relationships between time, cost, and quality. So that was, that was what we were like. Right? That's where we were. We didn't have the sort of tool sets that you have. And a lot of our project management was done by walking about. The other thing that was interesting was that the project team was mostly in the same location. We didn't really have virtual teams because communication were just too was just too difficult. We did work, the first project I was on, we were in a consortium with companies in Italy and in Germany and other companies in the UK. But we couldn't have video conferences, we couldn't do teleconferences, we were still sending faxes to people and, and telexes, telexes, that was good stuff. A acres and acres of paper we used. But we didn't have the kind of communication. So if you wanted a meeting, you had to all go off and visit. So we used to have meetings all over Europe, which was good. It was, it was a new way of life for, for me. So what then happened? Then we had improvements in the IT. We, we got vaxes and we got PCs. And that gave us an improved speed of reporting. So suddenly, you, know, you did have access to things. You could look after your own, after your own charts. It was quite useful. And then we had better contact with the data. So instead of having to go to the IT department and say, please, will you give me a copy of this document? You could get your own. You could even send it to the printer and you could look at it yourself. So that was good. We still had problems though. We still had awful problems. And if I tell you a story that in the late 1970s, if you look then at all the IT projects that were underway, over 90% of them had problems. 90% of the projects in IT. And apart from IT, the others weren't much better. Building had a rather better rate of success but it was still nothing like the, the rate you would expect. And so, where did we go wrong? What do you think it was? What, what, what have we been focusing on? We've been focusing on cost, schedule, time, and quality, the expectations. And this is what was happening. So we've been putting all that effort into our chasing of cost, time, and quality, we were still getting it wrong. So what do you think we did? What do we usually do when we're in trouble? Hmm? Well, I'll tell you what. That's what we did. We spent lots of money. And what did we spend it on? This is an industry throughout the world. Well, we spent it on things like processes and procedures. Like what, for instance? Well, we spent a lot of money on management methods. We spent a lot more money on development methods. Everybody had their own pet one, and organizations went through all these changes. I'll tell you what, by the time I've finished this list, you'll be so glad that I'm not going to give you a page on each one. <laughs> we spent a lot of time on product breakdown structures. <coughs> I did say before I started, if I say anything and you think, I don't know what she's talking about, I wish you'd explain, please ask me. I'm not pre-programmed, I'm very happy. So if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know what that means, then just wave your hand about and, tell, and, and, and I'll be happy to answer the question. And you know that that will make you a hero. Do you know how that works? Well, you see, if you're sitting there thinking, I don't know what that's about, somebody else will be too. And if you ask the question first, then you've saved them from doing it, so you've become a hero. <laughs> so, so, 
Now, just feel free. If, if I say something and you think, what's that about? And if the question is out of, out of order, in the sense that I'll, something I'll talk about later, I can say that. But I'm very happy. I'd much rather you feel that you're understanding what's going on than me sort of standing here and talking to myself. Because I can do that anyway. It's not often I get a nice audience like this to talk to. So product breakdown structures, work breakdown structures, you've heard about them. We spent lots of time refining the way that we did them, everything else, really good stuff. We did risk and issues management. Now that was new, because when I first started in the business, we didn't believe in risks. Risks were for wimps. No, nobody, we were technologically supreme. We were technically absolutely at the cutting edge. We didn't have any risks. We could do anything we thought of. Absolute nonsense, of course. But this was the way we felt. We didn't feel that risk was anything that, that came into our orbit at all. And if a customer said, we need to understand the risks associated with this project, do you know what we did? Well, we would hire somebody. We would hire somebody, we'd give them a big salary, we'd give them the best workstation in place, and we'd put them in a corner and we'd say, right, now you're looking after risk. We wouldn't talk to them or anything like that. We wouldn't involve them, we would just say, you're in charge of risks. And then we'd carry on as we'd done before. So we had a lot of work to do on risk and issue management. We had to start understanding it. Do you know about Lord Nelson? Lord Nelson, he was a famous admiral, and in one of his early battles, uh, he lost his eye. So he had one blind eye and one good eye. And at the Battle of Trafalgar, one of his captains came to him and said, Sir, sir, look over there. And he, and ships, I see ships. And Lord Nelson quite deliberately took the telescope and he put it to his blind eye. And he said, ships? I see no ships. And that's how we were with risks. We had the telescope to the blind eye and we weren't looking at them. We didn't understand them. We now understand a lot better, but it's something we had to do something about. Life cycle management, this is another one. It gave us a lot of advantages. It stopped us from working in the sort of silos technically that we'd been in before. It was good. Configuration management, we recognized the importance of configuration management. Hey, and there's more. You wouldn't believe how much more there is. Project planning and control, earned value reporting, total quality management. I remember my total quality training. It was wonderful. The chief executive of the business had said, we are a total quality organization. Everybody in the business must go on a total quality course. So we did. And I remember what I was taught on that course. I learned that I could only allow the telephone to ring four times before I picked it up. This was symbolic of being a total quality organisation. I didn't allow the phone to ring for ages. And we put a lot of effort into this, uh, but it was the sort of initiative that was poured on us from the top. And you know if you pour things over something from the top, some of it sticks, but most of it runs away and goes down the drain. But well, that was a bit like our total quality efforts. Return on quality, this was another approach to getting, getting things better. Value management, document management systems. People made a fortune about managing documents and looking after them. Are you keeping up with all this? You've got it all down and you all understand these techniques. Don't you? Yeah. I knew you would. Change control systems, that goes with configuration management earlier, but we need to do that, we needed to do it. And what, what was even more exciting was that we spent time training project managers to use them. Before that, we hadn't really trained project managers. We kind of grew them, and we anointed them. We would say, tomorrow, my son, when you wake up, you'll be a project manager. But we hadn't done anything about developing their skills. And this is why you've got a great advantage, because you are having the opportunity to do that. So we did all this stuff. Now, I tell you we were going to spend a lot of money, and we did. So, this is what I call 
first order project management. All those sort of tools and techniques. And we're busy focusing on the magic triangle. We're still looking at cost, time and quality, but we're able to do it in more detail, more accurately and so forth. So that, you'd think that was good, wouldn't you? Did you not think we'd done a wonderful job on that? No? There was something missing, wasn't there? Because in the late 1990s, somebody did a survey of the IT projects and guess what they found? Over 90% of IT projects were unsuccessful and they weren't much better elsewhere and we were still getting wrong, it wrong. The costs, the schedule and the expectations. People were not happy with what's happening. And if you look in the press, the press is cruel to us as project managers. They like to report failures. They like to report things going wrong. Uh, but we do sometimes ask for it, some of the things we undertake without thinking about it. <coughs> We're still in this problem, so what do you think we needed to do? Well, we needed to move into what I call New Age Project Management, or as my good friend and colleague Michael Kavanagh says, Second Order Project Management. And this was a realisation that success is equal to not just all these tools and techniques, 20% of it was due to procedures, processes, and hard skills. All these techniques in how to do things properly. And the rest of it, 80% of the success, was due to the attitude, the behavior, and what we call the soft skills, the dealing with people. It's people that make projects. And this was an important realization. It came to us when we looked at the uh, international competency baseline that was reissued about 10 years ago, for the first time in there, the international competency baseline wasn't full of tools and techniques. They were all there, but on top of it was the dealing with people, understanding people, leadership, making teams, making things happen. Now, you can have a big debate as to whether it's 20% and 80%. That's the view of one of my American colleagues. I have a friend in Volkswagen in Germany uh, called Reimer Hübner. Reimer believes that it's 40% processes and then 60% attitudes and soft skills. I don't mind. We can have a huge debate about it, whether it's the people or the tools. But what's important is that the tools are subservient. You can't do without them, but the important element is what you do with the people in the project, how you make use of them. How you actually find what are their skills and make them do things? How do you cope with it? I meet so many project managers and they run ragged. They're exhausted. And you say, why? Why are you rushing around? I have so much to do. As a project manager, you don't have to do everything yourself. You just have to make sure that you delegate to the right person to do things and you give them the right instruction. And that's one of the things that project managers do wrong. They're unwilling to let other people do things because they don't have confidence. But to tell you a story about that, I was called into my boss's office at one point, and he said, Mary, I want you to take charge of this group. I was going to be responsible for the company software group. And I said, well, that's very nice, you know, but uh, what do you want me to do? He said, well, you just carry on doing what you're doing. So I said, well, what are my boundaries? And he said, you haven't got any. So it was a moment where I picked myself up off the floor. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, well, look, I've appointed you to this job because I know that you can do it. And he said, and I will believe that everything you try to do will be in the best interests of the job because I trust you. He said, but there will be times when you get it wrong. And he said, and if that happens, I'm not going to shout at you in public. As long as you tell me what you're doing, keep me informed on what you're doing, that if something goes wrong and you have overstepped the mark, then I'll defend you to the hilt in public <coughs> and reserve the right to shout at you in my office. <laughs> and I thought, that was a fantastic deal. You think about it. I was, he was trusting me with taking over this group and his way of motivating me was to say, well, 
You get on and do it. I trust you to do what you're doing, but just tell me what you're up to. Don't come and ask me all the time, but just, I don't want to hear from somebody else that you've done anything. Just tell me what you're doing. And if you've got it wrong, <coughs> then we'll sort it out together. But I'm not going to run you down in public. And I thought, if I can be like that when I have my own department, I'll be really pleased. And I followed that. I used to say to my folks, you make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. <coughs> I only get angry if you, try, if you try to hide them from me. And if you imagine that I'm an idiot and I won't notice. If you have made a mistake, come and talk about it. Let's put it right. And then let's think about how we, how we prevent it from happening again. These are the sort of skills we're talking about, soft skills. And by the way, I don't get angry with you for making a mistake. I get really angry with you if you make the same mistake twice. And I think that's important. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about soft skills. We're talking about managing your team, getting them to do things. My greatest ambition when I was running a big department was to reach the point where all the hard work was being done, I was delegating it to everybody else. And I then had the time to sit and think and work out a strategy for where we went next. Because if you don't have time to stop and think, you don't get time to make decisions. So running yourself ragged with lots of activities when somebody else could be doing it for you is not the way to do it. So. We can talk about it, as I say. You can go from 2080 to 5050, so how much? But what's for sure is that without soft skills, your project management will not work. So, we've now got some more ideas about this. People say, are projects becoming more complex? Now, my view is that they aren't. My view is that complex projects have always been complex. It's just that we're now getting better at recognizing it. We, don't, we, we didn't recognise that we had problems, that we had complexity on our hands. We just went ahead and did it. Like risk, you know, we don't realise until you stop to think about it. Another thing that's happening is that project management is becoming more professional. Not very many years ago, you would have been hard put to find any university courses in project management at any level. You might find people doing theses. The work on the original Iron Triangle was done as part of a PhD thesis by somebody 30 years ago. But there were no courses like this. You wouldn't see people doing it. It's becoming more professional. We'll talk about that, what that means later. Projects are becoming much more open to outside influences. You used to be able to do your projects in private. But now you've got the newspapers and the media and the television, everybody after you. Yep. There's a lot more people involved. Uh, stakeholders, people are getting involved. <coughs> so if you did a project in one part of the country, nobody else would know about it really. But we have speed of information, we have people getting involved. So we have lots more stakeholders. We also have a lot more changes in technology. How many of you have recently bought a new bit of kit? You know, a new PC, an iPad, a new phone, or whatever? Right. And a week later, were you still happy with what you bought? Because <laughs> things change. You, know, you wait forever to buy something. And then you buy it. You take it home, you just get it working, and then the next version comes out. And you've missed out. And this happens, this happens in a lot of technological projects. The um, latest, greatest jet fighter, the Anglo-French uh, US project, is now in its something like its 12th year of running. And in that 12 years, they've had to change the technology quite dramatically. I think it's something like five times because of the changes and the availability of new bus technology for the, the transmission of, of communications. So there's a lot of things that change rapidly. And complex projects are essentially very dynamic. There's a lot of change in them. There's change in technology, there's change in other things, and there's a lot of uncertainty associated with them. So that's what we're talking about. 
And in order to cope with this complexity, we need to have a, soul, a whole systems approach so that we're looking at the way that things link together. So that we're looking at uh, the way that systems engineering thinking links with project management. That we need to have a view of where this project's going and what are the real outcomes that we want. Not getting down focused on the details. So the next steps for project management are going to include this focus on complexity. And what we need to do in order to do this, it's, there's a lot to learn. And there's a lot in a, in a complex project, there's a lot of things that you've got to deal with. And just imagine, you're running a project, and at the moment it's costing your company half a million pounds a month, paying, your, paying the team and everything in it. Now, you have to make a decision about where the project's going next. What do you do? How do you decide to make your decision? How do you cope with that? You see, you can't say to them, sorry guys, I just can't make up my mind at the moment, there isn't quite enough information, I can't solve this problem. Uh, would you just mind waiting for three weeks? You, know, you can get paid, but you haven't anything to do. Well, how do you make your decision? And that's one of the things that you learn. This is learning from experience. And most of us don't live long enough to learn all the things that we need to do. So what we need to find are people who've done this sort of stuff before. There are some people who are very good at it. The, the man who currently is running the Joint Strike Fighter program, Tom Burbage from Lockheed, he has been responsible for running a lot of these very complex <coughs> projects. And he knows how to do it. So if you learn from him, and learn from his examples, then you start to develop your own intuition. You start to develop your ideas. You start to take things and think, ah, I know what happened when that happened on that project. So that's what I mean by learning to develop your own intuition. So that instead of saying to your team, sorry guys, you'll just have to wait while I make up my mind, you can say, well, I've got enough information to make a decision. So let's go that route. And the downside of it is that if it's the wrong decision, then you have to develop another characteristic of complex project managers. You have to be big and brave. And you have to go back to your team as soon as you see that it's going wrong and say, I'm sorry, I need your help. We've got to dig ourselves out of this. We've got it wrong. <coughs> now, that's very hard to do because project managers are told when they start off that they have to know all the answers and they have to be able to answer all the questions. And the thought of actually saying you've got something wrong is quite hard. But that's what you need to be able to do. You need to be able to take your team with you so they'll say, they'll respect you for making that decision and help you to get your way out of it. So we need to develop intuition. We need to learn from the way that other people do things. And how do we learn? How do we learn from experience? Making mistakes and... Yeah, making mistakes and then learning from that, yes. As a child, how do we learn? Yeah, you're surrounded by learning experiences, so you hear things and you... And observing. Observing, absolutely, and being part of and listening to things. You don't learn by writing down experiences and putting it into a database because most databases of experience are what I would call write-only memories. They get Stuff gets put into them and then nobody knows how to get them out again. It's a great skill in devising experience-based databases. So we need to learn from storytelling. We need to learn from being there. We need to learn from every project that we're ever on. <coughs> I was very fortunate because when I first started, um, every Friday, lunchtime, we, the team would go out for lunch. And then we'd go back to work, and at about three o'clock, we'd all congregate in the project manager's office, and we'd talk through all the things that had happened during the week. And for somebody like me, who was new to industry, 
having been at university, I could ask questions. And nobody ever said I was asking daft questions. All my questions were treated seriously, and I learned a lot because I could listen to them and I could hear, and they would explain to me why we'd done something in particular. That was a great opportunity for me. And it doesn't happen now so much. Now you get, you're, you're given a, a formal mentor and you can talk to them for half an hour a month or something. But for me, that was really important. It was a question of learning. All these people, I had those years of experience in the room. And they were explaining to me why they were doing things. So that's important, learning from it. The other thing that we have in complex project management is that Despite all the efforts that we made on the new tool sets, some of our current tools aren't really adequate to cope, so we need to think about how we're going to do them. Now, there's been a big debate about what do we mean by complex. And for a lot of people, if a project is very big, they say it's complex. Not necessarily. To be complex, we need to be able to have great uncertainty, things that aren't sure. It can't be broken down into little pieces. You know the old story about how do you eat an elephant? How do you eat an elephant? Piece by piece, a piece at a time. And that's how we've traditionally done our projects. We break them down into work breakdown structures. And we, we create all these pieces, all these tasks. But if you've got a complex project, when you break it down into, into pieces, the pieces don't necessarily have outcomes that you can predict. You have a work package and there are questions about how you're going to solve it. And if you perform the solution in one way, it has an impact on something else. This is what we call a wicked problem. You have a problem, you solve it, but it creates one somewhere else. It's like, uh, you know those balloons filled with water? You know, and you put your finger in and there's, there's things move around inside. Well, the problems are like that in a, in a complex project. A very large project, very expensive project can be complex, but it's, more, it's also likely to be complicated. We say that complicated is something that you can solve it. You, know, you can work in a linear fashion. You know what's going to happen next. There's no uncertainty in it. So if I take an example like, you know the building they've just topped off and they're starting to fit out in London, the Shard. Have you seen that enormously tall building with a big point on the top? And one of our royal princes did something for charity by abseiling down it. Huge great building and it's over the top of London Bridge Underground Station. Now the building itself is relatively straightforward. The complex element was all the uncertainty associated with putting in the foundations. Because they have this, it's the largest, the tallest building in Europe. They had all this weight to support. But they had to build it on land that they weren't sure how to work, how, what the consistency was. And it was also over all those tunnels and the underground and the railway station. So uncertainty was at the beginning of the project. Once they'd got the foundations in and they'd solved these problems, then they were able to move on. And it was, then became just a complicated project because they knew what they had to do to build it. They were using new techniques, but they knew how to do it. So complicated is something where you can find the solution. Complex is where you get into great uncertainty and you can't break it down. And your elephant-sized pieces are, aren't as reliable as you expected. The other thing about a complex project is that you have lots and lots of stakeholders. So the elements of complexity then? Uncertainty. Number of stakeholders. Who do I mean by stakeholders? Who are these stakeholders? What are they? What do they do? Well, in some industries, does anyone want to answer me? Or shall I just carry on talking to any ideas as to who we have as stakeholders in any project? Anyone who is affected by the project, inside or outside? Absolutely. All can affect your project. So it Very works both ways. Have a benefit. Yep. Yeah, it could be benefit. It doesn't matter. It's They can be affected positively or negatively by the project. 
or they can have an impact on your project, positively or negatively. And so there are groups of people, of individuals, who are part of the project, maybe part of the team. Uh, I call those primary stakeholders. And then there's another wider group, which are secondary stakeholders. They're not part of the, they're not part of the, the project. They're in the system of the project, if you like. They're in the environment, and they can have an impact on it. So there's a lot of those, lots of stakeholders. The usual stakeholders are people like the customer. Who is the customer? What's the definition of the customer for a project? It's not a trick. <coughs> Everyone who has the, the, to get the result of the project. Not quite. That's, that's exactly what I hoped somebody would say. <laughs> The, the, the customer for the project is who's going to pay the bill. So that if I think of some of the projects that I've worked on, which were for the Ministry of Defence, the customer was the Ministry of Defence. Imagine I was working on a project for a radar system that was based on a ship, a naval radar system. And it was being purchased by the Ministry of Defence, so the customer was somebody who was driving a desk in Abbey Wood in Bristol. That was the person who was actually buying it under directions, but that was the customer. His responsibility was looking after his budget. The end user, which are the people that you're talking about, was a sailor who was actually on the ship in a Force 10 gale in the North Sea and the radar wasn't working. And he was the one who had to climb up to try and get this thing fixed. Now in radar technology, you've got different ways of doing things. You can have a, a, a cabin on the ship which allows you to do a lot of the repair work remotely. You can sit in the cabin which will either be on the deck or underneath in, 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 in amidships and allows you to operate things remotely, you know, like remote fault testing and so on. Or you have to climb up the mast and fix it. So as an end user, you would actually prefer to have the cabin that you could do the work remotely from. But that costs a lot more. And as the customer, you want to protect your budget. So there's a conflict between what the end user wants and what the customer wants. So they're important stakeholders. And very often we have this question of, do we, do we, uh, do we understand who the stakeholders are? And how do they relate to each other? And very often we find the different stakeholders have got opposing views of what's happening. And they have different amounts of influence. There are stakeholders who have a lot of influence. The customer has a lot of influence because they can decide they don't want it and then cancel it. They'll pay the, pay the money for cancelling the order, but they can do that. The end user doesn't have so much influence. They can just make life miserable for the people who are trying to fit the kit and the people who are and, and be a nuisance to the customer, to, you know, upset them. So they have different amounts of influence, different ability to do things. If you, you live in a very nice part of the world, you live out on the moors outside Newcastle, and somebody decides they're going to put a wind turbine up in front of your house, how do you feel about that? It's, it's not going to be sort of across the way, if it's a few yards away, 100 yards, 200 yards away, uh, it's going to actually block your view. How do you feel about that? You're a stakeholder in that. You have a view. You have a very strong view. You're very interested in the fact that your view is going to be ruined, and you might have all the side effects of noise and so on from wind turbines. No matter how you feel about sustainability, to, be, to have one as your next door neighbour is not much fun. So there you are, a stakeholder. How much influence do you have? Well, all right. Your brother-in-law is the local MP. Does that help? <laughs> <laughs> it might. But the thing is that on your own, you don't have a lot of influence. Just you're a household, you're a house owner, but you're being, you've got this thing, and it's bothering you. So there are several things you can do. You can go after influential people, 
and you can wind up support from elsewhere. You know, if you do have a convenient brother-in-law or somebody else, you can get them involved. You can also gather up support from other people in the same situation, so that you have a group of you, and then you, you have a bit of a louder voice. And then you find somebody who's going to help you to make a louder voice, so you get the local TV in and get them in, involved. So the influence of stakeholders is something that's really quite important for you. And one of the first things you do when you start off on a new project is to look at what the project's about, what are the objectives of the project, what is it we're trying to do. And then the next job you do is to look at the stakeholders. Who are they? Where are they? How much influence do they have? How can, you, how can they react together? Are they capable of stopping you or supporting you? you? That's a major job to be done. The other elements of uncertainty, the technology changes we can talk about. Projects last a long time. Some of the projects that I've worked on, uh, I've worked on the Astute Submarine. I've been involved with it now for 13 years. I'm not actively working on it now, I'm just a consultant. I go and talk about things on the, on the program. But projects that go on for a long time see all kinds of things changing. Not the least of the, of the things that change will be politics. So we have the length of projects give you issues in complexity. The length of supply chains. You know, um, in the radar business, we used to use things called radomes. We still use them, but I don't do it anymore. Um, a radome is one of those round things. If you look at filing downs, you see the, the, the big domes that cover up the radar, right? keep the weather out and everything. The number of people who manufacture radomes in the world, I think it's down to about four companies. So if you're a radar company and you want a radome, you don't have very much choice in who you go to for supplies. And supposing you've got two radars to build, or two different projects, if you go to the same supplier, and then you find that they're supplying half the rest of the world, you, you're going to have some difficulties. How do you make sure that your radome is going to get priority? How do you make sure that things are going to happen properly? And they're dependent on their suppliers. How do we know that they're getting the right information? So the length of supply chains is really important to you in complexity. Wicked problems. Wicked not in the sense of the musical that's currently on in Victoria, in London, but wicked in the sense of the systems thinking idea, which is that a wicked <coughs> problem is one where you can solve it, there's a, a range of solutions, and whichever one you pick, it will take you on somewhere further. These are not problems that are just limited to technology. So, uh, the World Bank is very interested in complexity, they're very interested in it because a lot of the charitable programs that they do, a lot of the things like solving issues of disease <coughs> in remote places. And you find that you can solve the problem in one place, and in the next village, a few miles away, culture is different, ideas are different, and the same solution won't work. So you have to think of different solutions. You have these wicked problems. How do you find the right one? Because whichever one you pick, it takes you on somewhere else which is difficult. And leads you, because of the interconnectivity of it all, leads you into difficulties. In order to be successful in running flexible projects, uh, complex projects, you need to be very flexible. You need to be able to plan, but you need to be able to move your plans rapidly enough in order to take advantage of the changes. And above all, you need to know where you've got to. You need to be able to track it effectively. So what we're seeing is we've got all these new problems that require new things to do, but we still need to know how to plan and how to track. So we've still got at the bottom of it, we've still got our magic triangle. But all these other things are connected with people, aren't they? So technology changes, long development times. Some of the things I've worked on, 
we've been using absolutely the latest technology to the point that one of the radar systems we built, uh, some of the micro, micro modules that we had to use, we'd only ever had three of them before, and they'd been created in the laboratory. And here we were proposing to build this radar system that required 40 of these for each system we built. Where were we going to get them from? How could we actually make sure that we had a manufacturer who could supply these in sufficiently big numbers when it had never been done before? So moving from research into project into production is something. Um, if I talk to you about COPS, commercial off the shelf, this was a, a solution that a lot of technology companies started to use. Uh, instead of building their own computers for their systems, for instance, if, a, if you've got a radar system, you have to have a radar control system for it. Instead of building the computers themselves, they would buy commercial computers because that would be easy. We'll just buy a load of computers. Good stuff. What you forget is that the manufacturers of these commercial computers, as we know, because we've talked about it just now, are constantly changing the standards that they're writing to, they're creating. So we've ordered a load of computers, and we need them delivered one a month for the next three years. Every one that comes is different because they're busy changing the software of the manufacturers. So the idea that we can buy things commercially off the shelf and we won't have any problems with configuration management, that's a miss. And then maturity levels. Um, what does that mean? Well, if you go into looking at technology projects, you'll find that there's a thing called the technology maturity matrix. This was something that was invented by NASA. Did you know that NASA don't actually build very much of their own kit themselves? Did you know that? They actually do designs, but they don't build it. They go to manufacturers, they go to suppliers. And they were constantly being let down by people who said, Yes, we can supply you that. We've got this wonderful idea. We've got this wonderful kit that we're going to use. And that, and we can deliver it. And when the time came, it wasn't delivered. And that was because the, the suppliers were saying, we have this, and they didn't. They had an idea. They hadn't, it wasn't a mature bit of technology. They had to then do a lot of development to take it from the idea into something they could sell. And that's why it was taking longer. So NASA developed this technology maturity matrix. It's worthwhile having a look at. You can look it up. Um, because it's something that we use too. We have a, a series of levels. You go from level one right through to level seven. And wise companies say that they want things at maturity level six. If they want them to live a, in a working way. Whereas... If you get something at earlier levels, it's really difficult. So for maturity levels, you've got to find out who's going to pay to get to the right level. The other thing is politics. Politics gets in the way of, of projects, long projects. These are bits of example about uh, the Eurofighter Typhoon. <coughs> no, uh, this was, was done, I cut it out of the paper sometime last year, but um, that everybody, each nation involved in the Eurofighter project had agreed to buy so many of the finished article. And then politically, governments changed, and people supporting the Ministry of Defences in different countries changed their minds. So we have this political issue that gets in the way. These are all factors that affect complexity. So, does it make sense so far? Yeah? If no, what, what, what would you like to have explained? Because I'm here for you. So I, I'm really happy if you want to ask me anything at all. But if not, we'll bash on then and we'll have a little look. Here's some examples. The Olympic Games. Uh, the Olympic Games, the first bid the costs, after Jacques Rogge had announced the, game, the games had been awarded to London, then the first thing that happened was that the Olympic Delivery Authority and the, the powers that be had to go back to the ministry and say, it's going to cost so much. 
or they had to put that into the bid. And their first thing was that they said it was going to cost two billion pounds. Cheap at the price, wouldn't you say? No, all that? Too cheap. Now, anybody looking at it would have said, that's not a realistic price. And in fact, within weeks of that price being published, they started finding things that were going to cost more. But it was politically a good idea to accept that two million, because the minister wanted to say, yes, we'll have the Olympics. And nobody wanted to say what it was really going to cost. So we have what's called the conspiracy of optimism. This is one you can look up. Conspiracy of optimism. It's an interesting idea, which is, it's not really a conspiracy, because a conspiracy is something that generally has bad vibes to it. But it just means that everybody knows that two billion pounds isn't going to be enough, but actually we desperately want to have the Olympic Games, so let's just say it'll do at two billion, and once we've started, then we can't step back. The current estimate, when this slide was put together, was around uh, over nine billion. In fact, they've actually come out of it pretty well when they had their final estimations and they've, uh, they've saved on their final agreed prices. There is money coming back from the various Olympic teams, not the athletes, but the, from the teams who are building and organizing the games. So this is, a, this is a, an example of a complex project. You might want to say it's a complex program because there are lots of projects associated with it, all that have to happen together to provide the Olympics. So that's a, that's a political driver that says we'll accept that price. If we look at the, the Concorde, in 1962, it was estimated it was to cost uh, 150 to 170 billion, uh, million French francs. By 1972, it had gone up to 2 billion. And the final cost was 10 billion US dollars. But you see, that's another project that everybody wanted to do. It was a very prestigious thing to be the first uh, supersonic airline. It was something, it was a demonstration of extreme technology. And so there was a will to make it happen. So even though the price was seen to be going up, this was another incentive. <coughs> if you get it wrong, any complex projects, these are the sort of things we have. And these are some quotes about projects from various people. Um, the United States Government Accountability Office says, in spite of all the investment aimed at improving project management, I told you all about that, you remember that great long list of things that we did? There's been no appreciable improvement in the last five years when compared to the previous five years. So that's what they thought in 2006. The National Audit Office, do you know what the National Audit Office is? Good, that gives me the chance to tell you. <laughs> I, the National Audit Office is a, a body that reports to Parliament, it reports to the Public Accounts Committee, and it investigates every spend, every spend of public money in the UK. And they produce reports. Every year they do a report of the top 10 projects in particular areas and how well they've done. Um, anything they produce regular reports on any kind of spending of public money. And the director of the public of the National Audit Office is a great advocate of project management and he's done an awful lot to help the UK government to improve its project management. And he's still in there battling away with them. But a review of major projects over the last 20 plus years reveals there's been little change in project success and they're generally late and over cost. They did produce another report three years ago looking at two particular developments which had come out late and over cost and they did a, a review of value for money and what they said was these two particular developments if the proper price had been in there at the beginning we paid the right price for them they only appeared over cost because the initial estimates were wrong it was an it was another example of this, let's put in the lowest <coughs> price and the quickest possible timetable that we can so that we get the job. 
but he, we do generally deliver value for money, but we start from the wrong point. So, to think about systemic failures. This was, this was an, an American example, and what happened was that they'd been trying to plan a, a military exercise, a naval exercise, to have two US Navy carrier groups to <coughs> practice capability. It was a big exercise that they'd planned. And they'd worked at it for around two years, setting this thing up. The project was launched. It was abandoned after two days. There's another example, Terminal 5. You all heard about Terminal 5? Terminal 5 was launched with a big flurry of disaster. No, terminal 5 at Heathrow. Magnificent. No, the building is superb. Everything else is great. And on the first day that it opened, the luggage system failed. People couldn't get to their points to, to work. Uh, lift, people were stuck in lifts all over the building. The employees couldn't find their way to the car parks. There's actually a very good uh, account of what happened on Terminal 5. Um, in the International Journal of Project Management about two years ago. It's worthwhile looking for. International Journal of Project Management and the report of Terminal 5. The thing about Terminal 5 was that they thought they'd got everything right. You know? They really thought that they had. What actually happened was that. <laughs> that was the baggage that got lost. Now, I've got a little story about Terminal 5 because I was asked to go and do a project health check on one of the, one of the subcontracts on the terminal. And I always ask one particular question whenever I go to do a health check, and I meet the project manager. And my question is, why are you doing this job? And so I met this chap and I said, why are you doing this job? And he looked at me as though I'd come from planet Zog. Look, who is this Dato? What does she want to know this for? Now, I wanted to know that because I wanted to understand what made him tick. If he'd said to me, because I want to make Terminal 5 the best terminal in airports, zone, I might have thought he was overdoing it a bit. But at least I would have understood that he was being driven by his desire to get something right. If he'd said to me, well, they're paying me a lot of money. That would have been fine, because at least I would have understood that what was driving him was being paid for the job. That was okay. If he'd said, I know, I couldn't find another job, or I'm looking to leave very soon, then at least I'd have understood. But there was absolutely nothing. I asked this chap, why are you doing it? Nothing, whatever. And do you know that that had a huge impact on the rest of his team? I went to visit the team office, and I've never seen a project office like it. It was a huge, great room. It was full of desks, and it had computers on, and lots of people sitting there. There wasn't even a name on the door saying which project team lived there. I've never seen a project office that didn't have charts on the wall, and targets, and what we're expected to do this week, and what are we, what are we going to build? Even a picture of what they want to achieve. Nothing. I thought, that's very odd. So I went round and I talked to everybody on this team. There were about 60 of them. Because I'd been asked to do this job by the board because they were worried. They didn't know what was happening in this project. They wanted to know what was going on. So guess what I asked each one of them? How about, why are you doing this job? And I got very few answers, except for the three guys who were going off on a daily basis over to the building site and installing bits of kit. The rest of them, they were just sitting there at their computer doing stuff. Uh, there was no direction to it. There was no real understanding at all. Anyway, there were lots of things wrong with this particular contract, so I finished my report. And then I went off to see the board who'd asked me to do it. This is another handy hint. If you're ever asked to prepare a report for a board, don't, whatever you do, email the report to the secretary.
because it'll just disappear into the drawer or maybe not, it, not even get off the hard drive mm -hmm. uh, and you won't get any visibility either. What you have to do is when you've done a report, then you print off a few copies and you make an appointment to go and talk to the people who asked you to do the job. So I went off to visit the board who'd asked me to do the job and I took my report with me. And so I went in and they were very gracious. Do sit down, have a cup of coffee, have another cup of coffee, have a biscuit. Wonderful. I said, look, before we start, can I ask you a question? Of course you can, anything you like. Yeah, you know, don't you? I said, why are you doing this job? And you know, some of them got really interested in the ceiling. <laughs> they, were, they were gazing at the ceiling and <coughs> stuff. And there was another couple of them who were desperately trying to see their feet, but the table was in the way, they were looking down. And they were shuffling their papers. And I sort of sat there and I looked around and I just grinned at them. And I thought, well, I've come for the morning, so how long you want to stay here, I don't mind. So I just grinned at each one in turn. And finally somebody at the very end of the table said, well, it's like this. We bought that company and the job came with it. <laughs> so at least I had an answer and it was interesting so I said so this isn't part of your normal expertise did you not think of subletting this job did you not think of giving it away finding somebody else and you look, he looked so astonished I mean for me that's an obvious thing to do if it's something you're no good at why, why try to do it sell it to somebody else move on and I thought for a minute they were going to offer me a job. I was busy thinking, how can I not accept a job with this lot? But it was interesting, you see, they hadn't thought about it at all. And the impact of them uh, not having any clue as to what they were doing, appointing a project manager who had no motivation, whatever, was really key to the fact so when this slot happened on Terminal 5, I thought, well, if any of the other sub-projects were in the mess that that one was, I can understand why it is. So, we go on to complex projects. This is about as near as you're going to get to a definition of a complex project. Complex projects are characterised by uncertainty, non-linearity and recursiveness. You know, you have to keep going back, round and round with things. They're best viewed as dynamic and evolving systems. This is the definition that ICCPM have put in place. This is what we're going to do. And then the next bit is my question. Why do we pretend that they're predictable, definable and fixed? And why do we use the same linear life cycle management models to, life cycle models to manage them? This is, this is really the big question about complexity. If you have a complex project, why do you ignore the fact? We've got to do something else about it to think about it. So, if I go back a minute, first order project management, these are all the sort of things that you see, you know? The tools and techniques that I talked about before. CMMI, the maturity models from CMMI, uh, the PIMBOK guide, Earn value management, life cycle management, Prince 2, etc., etc. All that long list that I gave you, right? And this is a quotation I really like on the subject. It comes from a good source. Albert <coughs> Einstein, I think, is, is right. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And that's actually very relevant to this because I spend quite a bit of my time going to look at new projects, things that are set up. And I often say to people, have you done this before? They say, oh yes. I say, what? Did, did you do it last time? Yes, I did. So then the question is, did it work last time? <laughs> and they say, no. So then you say, so what are you going to do that's different? And this is where this one comes from. And you know what they say to me? The usual answer is, we'll try harder. So do more of it. That was wrong before, they'll just do more of it and I'll try harder. They can still work. Because we need to think, we need to have a different sort of mentality towards thinking about it. So that's why I like this quotation. You know, 
We need all these tools and techniques, but on top of it, we need to do something else. Second order project management, which is what we're talking about, we're looking at finding the right contracting models. Most project, I don't know how much you know about contracts in, in project management, it's very often the thing that comes last in the way we study projects, but in an awful lot of cases, the contracts that are set up are very adversarial. They're always, um, unless you do this, I'm going to fine you something, you're going to lose money, you're going to do that, unless you, if you fail to deliver this, we'll claim damages from you. A lot of the contracts that we have are like that. If we have a complex project where things are likely to be changing, it's not us that need to be flexible, it's the rest of the team as well. So we need to have the right sort of contracting models that allow us to make changes without great penalties, that allow us to do things without having a lot of difficulty. That we should be not just looking at the requirements of what we're doing, but what's the outcome of this project expected to be? Yes? No, you're talking about the group of contracts. Yeah. Uh, is there any examples of those things that you would... Well, there, there are, yes, I can tell you about the contracting models that they used in the Olympic Delivery Authority in the transport area. And normally, you would expect to spend, uh, on a big, a big contract, you'd spend sort of a matter of months getting the contracts together to decide what it is to do. And nobody does anything, nobody spends a penny a wrong phrase to use, but nobody spends any money at all uh, until <coughs> the contract's been signed. What they did, because they knew that their time scale was finite, they had to open the Olympic Games on that date. They couldn't say to everybody who poured in, sorry folks, we're not quite ready, would you like to come back next week? So they had to beat those dates, and so they were keen to get started as soon as possible. And they were particularly keen to identify risks and to sort that out before. So instead of spending a huge amount of time doing detailed contracts and then signing them up in great state, what they did was to get people together, uh, the team that, from all the different transport areas that they were going to be using, and they signed memoranda of, memoranda of understanding. So they would actually agree, it says, this is what we're intending to do. And by the way, the limit on the money we're going to spend to start off with is this much. And then after that, they worked, and they ran the whole thing on the basis of trust. They developed good relationships between the people, and they were later able to fully define, and they used the NEC model for, for contracts. But, and that has built into it the ability to move things, so NEC contracting models were good. But in order to get the job underway, they started off by signing up the contracts. And a lot of, of organisations, when they put in place a contract, they set up a team to mark, you know, if we use a football term, they man mark. So that if they've got somebody for risk on their team, they'll have somebody for risk on the other team. They said, we can't afford all that. They had a team for the Olympic Delivery Authority of Transport. Their central team was eight people dealing with a whole host of others. And what they said was, the people who run Transport for London are the experts. Why should we go and hire an expert when we've got their expertise? So we're going to develop a relationship and trust them. If we want to talk to National Rail, they're the experts. Why do we want to go and pull in a consultant from somewhere else? We'll develop a relationship and we'll work with them. So this was a completely different sort of model. If you go to the, if you're working with the Ministry of Defence in the UK, you find that they send you, they, spend, they have a whole team of people who are attempting to do the job, not knowing all the details about it, and they establish a requirement. And then they become the MOD team, and there's one mapping into every member in the suppliers team. So they're using twice as many people as they need to. And then they come up with these very restrictive contracts. So that's what I'm talking about when we want something a bit different. Does that make sense? Yeah. Where do you work? No, no, it's uh, for a project. Oh, right. Okay. That's right. Well, it's, it, it's getting that 
to start with and saying, you know, we've got to get past this, we've got to kill off all the risk, do as much as we can. And they made an early start. They actually started spending money before they had any contracts finally signed. I've got... Yeah. How does that work with the public sector? Procurement where quite often you need a contract with the thing, any, uh, any company that only works going forward. Yeah, well that, that's one of the reasons why the public sector finds itself a lot of the time in difficulties, because they're trying to do the job of their contractor as well. I, you know that the, um, the schools improvement program that was established, well, I live in Kent, and together with another colleague, we were looking at reports in the newspaper about things that were going wrong on those schools for the future programs. And so we went, we made an appointment with the people who were running it. And we went to offer our services free of charge as concerned taxpayers, but we felt we could help them. And so we were asking them how they ran their project. And these two people sat there and we said, so how did you actually award the contracts to these people? Oh, well, we went through the appropriate contracting mechanisms. So how did you decide which one to, to pick? Well, we went for the cheapest. Okay, so did you know what they were going to do? Uh, well, yes, yes, I mean, they said they were going to do everything they wanted. Mm. So that left us to cynical people and practitioners from the real world thinking, oh, yes. So then we said, now, how do you man monitor what's happening? Do you keep track of what's going on? Oh, yes, they said. They said, yep, we get a report every month on how much they've spent. So <laughs> Graham and I looked at one another. It was almost as, are you going to say it or shall I? And I, it, it, he grinned at me, so I said, so do you know what they've done with the money? And do you know what these people said? we couldn't possibly interfere with them to that extent. Now, do you wonder that projects run like that go wrong? <coughs> Actually, it's sad. There are a lot of people who believe that you know, if, if they're checking that the money's been spent, they don't want to interfere in what it's been spent on. They could have all gone all over the place. You know, they could have had lovely trips to Paris from where we are. You know, investigative trips on schools on, you aren't using the Eurostat. It would be fine. But no, they just, they didn't like to interfere. And I think this is something that has to change. I'm going next week to a public sector conference on project management, and there's a major change that's taken place in government. The Office for Government Commerce that used to exist, for all procurement, has now been taken over by the Major Projects Authority. And the Major Projects Authority has got a whole series of rules, and they're they've, uh, engaged Oxford Said Business School to provide the senior members of public departments with the necessary leadership skills to start managing projects better. That's the bit that's missing. But it's not it's not malicious, it's just they don't understand and nobody's ever taught them before. <coughs> so this is why sometimes it goes astray. And people are driven by the best of motives. And there's this feeling, well, it's public sector expenditure. And I've been to another conference, and I got the feeling that, do you know an animal farm where they talked about four legs good, two legs bad? Well, in the public sector view, public sector was good. Anything commercial was bad. Now, actually, we, still, we all have the same responsibility to spend public money in, to get the best value for it. So it's not rude, it's not interfering, it's not being unnecessarily curious to, to actually make sure that you're getting that value for money. And some organisations think that if they create processes that have got lots and lots of signatures on, then that will make sure that they've got it under control. It doesn't. It's an illusion of control. The best example I ever came across was I was doing some work with a Russian organisation and they sent me their document which was something they were going to give to Russian departments, government departments, on how to run projects. 
and I took one look at it. I went once through it, all 275 pages of it, and said, this won't work because you've got so many blocks, so many checks, so many people signing pieces of paper that nobody will be able to do anything. No one can spend any money. Nobody can actually do anything. You have to have the right sort of levels of authorization so that people can do things. You don't actually get control by stopping everything. It, it was just like, I don't know, every joint in the place was had our arthritis. It was just, it couldn't move, it was all creaking, it was terrible. And this is very often a problem that you get, that people feel that if they put in a, a very strong procedure with lots of autographs on it, then it will prevent anything from going wrong. And what happens is that people get so fed up that they ignore it, they don't follow the rules, or nothing happens. So it, it is worth thinking about. So appropriate contracting models is really important in complex projects, so that you do have the flexibility to move, so that you do move quickly if you want to, without having problems making sure that you're going for the right outcome. Outcome management is really important. More than delivery of a requirement. So what, what do you really want to happen as a result of this project? Um, I've probably got time to give you an example. There was somebody who stood up from the Department of Work and Pensions, a minister, um, early on, just been appointed, wanted to make his mark. So he stood up and he said, he had this brilliant idea, he had been looking at the world and in his view it was all wrong that pensioners and people should always have to go to the post office to collect their pensions on Thursdays. So this was well known to all the muggers who would congregate, they'd wait around the corner for people to come out of the post office with their pension money and bash them. And, and he said, this was all wrong, nobody should have to do this anymore. So he would inaugurate a project that would then have all people's, all pensions delivered directly into people's bank accounts. And everyone, hooray, well done, what a good bit of thing. No, very nice. No more old ladies bashed over the head. This is a great outcome. If he'd stopped and thought about that and discussed it with people before, he would have come up with a whole lot of different ideas. Um, one is that how many of these old people collecting their pensions had bank accounts? And a lot of them, A, didn't want a bank account because they didn't trust the banks anyway. And then if you think about a lot of people on benefits and you think about banks, how many people on benefits do banks <coughs> want as customers? So there was a big problem there. You know, how many people actually have bank accounts? How many would the banks take? And then how are they going to get the money out of the bank anyway? It's another little issue. So there was some more thinking about that. The first step then in this project was to find out the answers to some of these questions. I think that what the minister had thought was that all he had to do was to set up a bank's system, put in everybody's bank account numbers, and all their benefits would be paid automatically, and that would be lovely. But it was an awful lot more than that. And it wasn't just a single project. It was a program. They had to, first of all, find out who had bank accounts. Then they had to find out what they could do about the people who didn't have bank accounts. How could they persuade some, some bank to take them on? And what they had to do was to go back to the post office and say, will establish a special sort of bank. You're much too young to remember, but we used to have something called the Post Office Gyro. And that was, that was a bank run by the Post Office. They got rid of it because it was difficult to run, so they had to reintroduce it. So they had to do all that. Then they had to have a campaign to persuade the people who didn't trust banks and didn't want a bank account that they wanted them. And then, and only then, could they start actually setting up these payments. And then there's a gap. There is a gap. You have to wait for things to be finished off and you have to have signatures for bank accounts. So what do these people do while they were waiting for their bank accounts to be sorted out? Did they live on thin air? So 
very interesting. What is the outcome that they wanted? I don't think he wanted, the outcome that he wanted was for people to be safer and to, to be paid very rapidly, but the real outcome for that was chaos and a hugely expensive program that went on for something like eight years. They're still struggling to get it to all happen. So, adhocratic leadership. This means a leader who's available and prepared to make decisions ad hoc, to make decisions as they're needed. You can't not make decisions in the project. If you're a project manager, you need to make decisions. You need to be able to respond to, to the requirements that you've got. And you have to do it quickly, often with a minimum of information. Thinking systemically is still a very important thing for me. Thinking of where your project's going, the whole thing. There's a great tendency for us as project managers, especially if we're technical ones and we have technical expertise, it's a great tendency to get stuck into the technical detail. And actually, as a project manager, that's not what you're there to do. You have people to do the technical detail. <coughs> what you should be doing is looking at where this project's going. Is it still going in the right direction? I liken some project managers as people who, they have a project to get themselves from London to Edinburgh, and the only tool they've employed is an A to Z of London. No. They can find their way to the M25, and after that, the technical term is their stuff, because they don't know where to go thereafter. So you need a systems view. You need to be able to see where are you going with this project. Then you can look in detail later, but you always need to have the end in view. Look at your outcomes, what you want to do. Experiential learning, that's learning from other people's experience. And Requisite variety. Do you know about the law of requisite variety? No. no? Right, that's good. Well, it actually comes, initially it was noticed in, in a biological sense, that if you have a field, or we saw examples of it in, in the States where they had acres and acres, rolling acres of wheat, all the same variety, yeah? All different, all, all the same variety, and the, it was attacked by an insect. They lost the entire crop. The whole of this area was turned into a dust bowl because they lost it all. And if you look in, at farms in the UK, you find that people have got different elements of variety. So that <coughs> if you have variety, you always have the ability to survive because somebody's going to be not affected by it. And this applies to projects as well. There's a tendency to say, when you're putting together your team, you want people who are going to agree with you. You don't want any hassle. You don't want any of these awkward people who are going to make life difficult. You want to have somebody who's, you know, have a team of people all going in the same direction. It's not right. Actually, you do need variety. You need different people. You need different views. You need somebody occasionally to put on a different pair of specs. Um, how do you make pearls? You have a bit of sand in an oyster that itches. So you get something beautiful from that itchy bit. It's the same with your project team. You need to have variety. You need to have diversity. You need to have different groups of people. Because you do need to have input from different places. So those are the sort of things that we should be thinking about. Not just establishing a project management team that we, we like, you know, I've worked with him before, I get on very well with him, we'll have him, we'll have him, we'll have her. Think about, do we have enough <coughs> there? Do we have enough ideas? When we get stuck, do we have anybody who's going to come up with the, the thing that's going to save us from the bugs that's eating the rest? Does that make sense? Yeah? So, that's another one to look up. The law of requisite variety. I've only given you a very sort of, applying it to, to our our area of projects, but it is an interesting thing. And it's important in, in biology as well. Program management lessons that haven't been learned, things that we've done wrong. We don't look very well at customer requirements and acceptance criteria. How do we, what do we know what the customer is actually going to want? Do we know? They've sent us this great big book. I worked on the Boeing 777 primary flight controllers. 
they sent us a requirement that was like 14 volumes of the Encyclopaedia Britannica. It had everything in it that they could possibly think of. <coughs> they didn't want all of it. There were some things that they really wanted, some functions they really wanted, some things that were nice to have, and some things they just weren't too bothered. They'd just see what we could do with them. So do we understand exactly what it is? I can give you an example of that, just to lighten the mood a bit, as it's nearing Christmas. Little boy tells his mum, Mum, I've decided I know what I want for Christmas. So mum said, yes, God, she's quite excited. She said, I want a bike. So off she went, had a chat with Dad. He wants a bike for Christmas. And they were delighted. You know, they knew what the boy wanted. That was great. So they went shopping and they brought this thing home. It came in a flat pack box, so they had to assemble it the night before and wrap it all up. And came Christmas morning, he came downstairs and there was this wonderful bicycle shaped package and he unwrapped it all and he looked at it. Oh, he said, thank you. His little face fell. And they thought, what's wrong? You know, he asked for a bike. We've given him the best bike we could find. They hadn't talked to him about it. Anyway, a bit later on during the day, somebody went to have a chat and said, what's the matter? You don't seem very pleased. He said, well, it's green. <laughs> <laughs> and what I really wanted was a red one. Well, look, customers are like that. You know, you can, you can bust everything to do something for them, but unless you've actually checked what is it they really want, you get, a, you get a green one instead of a red one. So just, you know, when you're thinking about requirements and customers, remember that little lad. So insufficient definition of the customer's requirements and acceptance criteria. You no, know, he accepted it, but only just. Program plans were inadequate or not in place. We sometimes behave as though plans for a project are a customer deliverable. And once we've done them, we stuff them in the drawer and forget all about them. And in fact, plans are important for us. There's a, a saying that people have, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. And we do need to do our plans and we need to keep them up to date. And when I'm talking about plans, I don't mean just the schedules. I mean, by a plan, I mean, how are we going to do it? It's the Baldrick coming plans that you're after. Your Blackadder fans. So how, are, how, are these, how are these plans? What do we know? How are we going to do these things? So we need to have them made in place and kept up to date. Change control is not adequately addressed. Cost, schedule, technical, and subcontract risks are not adequately captured. When we do risk analysis, if we're technical, we tend to focus on technical risks. But on the project, we don't just have technical risks, we have things with subcontracts. We have things to do with legalities. We have things to do with finance. A whole range of things that are risks. We have to get enough input in our project to get them all together. So this is something I think is important. It came out of the group that I teach in Australia. They said one of the most important things that they learned was to start challenging assumptions. because. We make assumptions whenever we do projects, whenever we do plans, whenever we do thinking. And you really need to stop and say, why are we making that assumption? Where does that come from? Is it right? You know, are they even reasonable? And it's all to do with this, well, we always do it this <coughs> way. And we'll just try harder because it went wrong last time. So challenging assumptions is something you need to think about. Um, we're awfully bad. At defining projects, at defining problems. We, we tend to think of things as problems and we're not looking at them really. We say, it won't do this. The question you should be asking is, why do we want it to do whatever it is? We need to think about it. Are there some alternative causes for the outcomes that we're seeing? We always, we focus, we like to find solutions quickly and we focus on the first. You need to give yourself time to think about the, the way, why things are going wrong. Am I responsible for the way that my team is behaving? 
And that project manager I spoke about, most of the things that his team were not doing was led by his example. You just don't realise how much impact you have on other people when you're leading a team or you're part of it. And do our objectives actually serve what we're wanting to do in the right direction? What factors do we believe are important to our success? Do we understand what they are? And are we assuming that we should know things we can't possibly know at this time? If we've got a complex <coughs> project that's using new technology, do we know exactly how it's going to be made in the future? So these are all things, the pathway to paradigm shifts. So what we need, right, I think, is for project managers to have a, a disciplined and academically sound approach. You focus on people, not tasks, processes, or things. You think critically. It doesn't mean you find fault with everything, but you mean critically, just look at what are there other options? Why are we doing that? Ask questions. The most important question that you've got in your armory as a project manager is why. Do you know how many times you should ask why? Hmm? Continuously until you get to the bottom of it, yes, that's true. But see, the first time you say to somebody, why are you doing it like that? They'll say, because we always do it like that. So then you say, well, why is that? I mean, I don't mean you have to go back to being two years old and drive everybody crazy by why, why, why. But, but ask them again. You can rephrase it if you like. Why do they always do it like that? And then by the time you've got into the third reiteration, the person you're talking to has started to think, why do we do it like this? And you've got them on their, on their, you've, you've got them on your side. They're starting to think. Why do we do it like this? Are there other ways we can do things? So why is very important to you. That's part of your critical thinking skills. Assumption challenging should be a way of life. Dialogue and diversity and increased conflict. That's counterintuitive if you like, but you need a good fight. You need a good conflict to actually make the best ideas come forward. It doesn't mean to say you have to be at war all the time. Very often, a really good argument is a way of, of getting to the bottom of something. It's not good behavior in a team when you think you're losing an argument just to shrug your shoulders and walk away. If it's something you really believe in, you, they have to convince you that you've got it wrong. Yeah. A focus on creating the right environment, not preoccupation with creating the right solution. Now, we don't know what the right solution is till we've got that. And then we have multiple paradigms, multiple methodologies, and the creativity to employ them effectively. What does that mean when it's at home, do you think? Well, it means that you know, there's Prince2, there's PIMBOK, there's the APM body of knowledge, there's the IPMA. All these things are tools for you as a project manager. And in complexity, you need to use whichever of them are going to help you. You learn, you pick things off the shelf. You don't slavishly follow one thing or another. You find the things, you understand where you want to go with your project and you find the right solution for you. So, future project management and what it means to us. How am I doing on time? I've got a little while longer. When you talk to project managers, an awful lot of them say, well, I'm not really a project manager. I just took the job on. Nobody wanted it. Yeah? We have a lot of them, the accidental project manager, we call it. Nobody else seemed to want to do it. So I found myself as a project manager. And the big one is, I'm really an engineer, but I actually am managing this project. So what's happened now, project management's now seen as a career. People want to become project managers. There are courses at all levels to learn how to become a project manager. Project management is being done everywhere. You know, in school, people do projects. It used to be the province of engineers, of construction people. Now we see projects in finance. I hesitate to say banks do projects, but they do. Sometimes they're quite successful. Um, we have projects in the media, we have theatre projects, we have projects, every, everybody's doing projects. 
One of the things that Tony Blair said, uh, which I have time for, I'm choosing my words very carefully, is that he announced that in his view, project management was a life skill and everybody ought to have some idea about how to do projects. And what was more, he actually put his money where his mouth was. And he put some money into one of the government departments to help APM to produce a course on an introduction of project management. And this is a course that's designed to have for people who are not going to go off and run major projects or get into complex projects, but people who are going to do projects just because it comes their way. You've, you run a youth club. Somebody suggests you apply for a lottery grant to do something. Suddenly you find yourself with the money from the lottery. How are you going to spend it? How are you going to do it? The introduction, introduction to project management provides you with enough skills to be able to manage that level of project quite well. So project management is being done everywhere. And so we're talking about becoming professional. What does that mean? So the answer to being a professional project manager is not an amateur. And as the NAO have said, the age of the gifted amateur is over. So they get paid for it. Now, would you suggest that that's a gifted amateur or is he professional? <laughs> Quite an old picture. It's not as blue as he looks these days. But still, he gets paid. This might be a professional as well. Uh, we have somebody taking information around. What we really mean by professional is in APM, we've started to look at the five dimensions of project management. As a project, as a professional, we're going to look at the breadth of understanding. We have to have knowledge about our projects. So there we come from the APM body of knowledge. We have the depth of ability, that's what you develop. That's your competence. And as you do more, as you develop, you get greater areas of competence. And you can identify the areas that you're not very good at if you look at the competency framework and try to improve it. Achievement. As a professional, you want to achieve some sort of qualifications. So that's what we move to. Commitment. You don't think you've done it all. Once you've passed your exam, you recognize that you've still got some learning to do. And so continuous professional development is something that we all do <coughs> on. And there's always opportunities for it. It doesn't mean to say you have to go to lots of talks. You can read things, you can do stuff. But it's always being curious about the way people do things. I learn a lot by going on industrial visits and looking at the way other people do things. There's a lot of clues of how you can manage your own business better. And accountability is the fifth dimension of a professional, where we have membership of a professional body with a code of conduct. If you join the Association for Project Management, you fill in your membership application form and you say, that if I'm elected as a member, I'm going to agree to the code of conduct. So I'm going to behave ethically and I'm going to look at things in the right way. Uh, a professional is also trained, competent to do the job, trained to use the job, trained to use the tools, so there's a tool, there's somebody about to use it. <laughs> Learning from yourself and from others, and aware of the standards. I think that standards are useful, and they're very, they're very helpful, and very often they'll help you out of a difficult situation. But you don't have to be obsessed by them, you just have to follow the way that you're going. And so, is there a professional? <coughs> is there a body that governs the profession and behaviour of its members? Does the organisation set standards? Are there ethical standards? Behavioural standards? And is our body governing the behaviour of our members? That's what APM does. So we have a code of ethics and people get asked to leave if they don't behave properly. We have to be responsible. As project managers, part of our professional responsibility, we're responsible to our clients or our employers. The environment. Sustainability is something that we've got to start thinking about. If you're asked to do a project that you know is going to cause damage to the environment, how do you cope with that? 
how do you actually work your way? Are you brave enough to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Boss, but I can't do this? Or are you going to go and talk to them about it? Do you believe that you need to do something about it? Understanding stakeholders and managing conflicts, because we know we're going to have them. How do we recognise a professional project manager? Is there a uniform? Well, is he a project manager? He might be. You never know. Because professionals and project management appear in all kinds of areas. We don't know what's happening. There's another lot. Some more. All these people can be project managers. Just because their uniform doesn't say they're project managers, we don't know that they are. Now, we're on the last slide now. Required characteristic for today's project managers. Key components. If you go to IKEA and you buy a flat pack box that says inside is one project manager, what are you going to find? And the first thing that you're going to find is leadership. You're going to find somebody who's going to be a leader. By leadership, I don't mean the sort of into battle, follow me facts, you know, with the, with the flag, let's go over the top all together. You do leadership in different ways. You do people leadership by demonstrating to people. You do leadership in a whole range of different ways, by paying attention to your team and persuading them that that's what they want to do. You have to be willing to learn from others, and that includes your team. Your team will be a group of experts, probably, from different disciplines, and you need to learn from them. So learning from others is really important. <coughs> when I first started in project management, project managers had this view that they had to know all the answers, and they were the boss, and they couldn't actually talk to anybody about anything they needed to do. They just had to stand there. Yeah. It was a very lonely position to be in. But it isn't. You learn from other people, and you learn a lot. And very often it's the person you think is least likely to help you. Somebody on the team who has a particular bit of information that can help. So you need that. Use of good interpersonal skills. Um, somebody who wanders around all day with a face like thunder, um, who dives into his office, shuts the door and sticks his head into his PC for the rest of the day. He's not demonstrating good interpersonal skills. He's keeping the people out. He's not talking to people. He's not being part of a team. He's not persuading people. We mustn't forget the, these days we have virtual teams as well. We have people that you have to contact by telephone, by video conference, in all sorts of different ways. But you need to be able to make contact with people. You need you don't get anywhere by actually terrifying the people who are working for you. I used to work for some folks. I remember once a senior <coughs> project manager, and I'd just been appointed, and I went to him and I said, I need some help. I, I would very much appreciate your advice. I think I've got a problem. And he looked down at me. He was quite a tall person. He looked down and <coughs> said, don't bring me your problems, sunshine. I just want answers. That is awful. And people still do that. So, be willing to listen. Even if sometimes you think, I really don't want to hear this again. I've heard it all before. Listening is an important skill. Um, my logo, my company logo, is an owl. And my business card has an owl on it. And the owl has long ears. And I picked the owl with long ears, especially, because I think project managers have to listen a lot more than we do. We listen, and we hear things, and then we can act on them. Communication is important to us, so good interpersonal skills we need. You knew that, didn't you? Yeah? Of course you did. So what's she telling us that for? But the ability to motivate people. How do you persuade people? How can you persuade somebody that they can do something they never thought they could? Because that's what it's about. You know, I used to really enjoy giving somebody a job that they'd never done before, they'd never tried before, and saying, I want you to do this. And because I believe in you, I think you can do it. It's like the story I told you about my boss. Motivating somebody to do something they never imagined they could. Helping them to grow. Growing people is probably a, a subversion of what project management's about. 
You have to be energetic. You can't wander around like a dying duck in a thunderstorm, being miserable and tired and uh, it's all too much effort. You have to be energetic. You, know, you have to get people inspired and feel cheerful. If you're miserable, it spreads right through the team. And if you're washed out and tired, you know, if you're yawning all over the place, go and do it somewhere in private. Yeah? But demonstrate energy to your team. You have to have a commitment to excellence and success. Hey, this box from Ikea is ever so full, isn't it? All this stuff you've got to do, but you're not going to be satisfied with second best. That doesn't mean to say you're going to go plate all your solutions, but it means you're going to do the very best that you can. You're not just going to say, oh, well, it's all right. No. We're delivering this car. It's got a flat tire, but never mind. We want to be excellent and we want to be successful. This is a really important one, a sense of humour. As a project manager, you get yourself in situations and you think, if I couldn't laugh at this, I'll cry. How on earth did I get into this position now? Why is this? And we all take ourselves so seriously. Learning to laugh at yourself is lesson number one as a project manager. And recognising, you know, we, we do make terrible exhibitions of ourselves from time to time. And you have to learn to laugh at it, you have to recognise it. And you have to be a human being, so having a sense of humour is really important. As is the next bit, you have to be a bit crazy to take the job in the first place. <laughs> There's just so much that you've got to do, you think, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. And then you remember, because it's exciting. Yeah. Because I'm doing something that nobody else has done before. Because the results will do something for somebody else. There's a whole lot of reasons why we do it. But you do have to be a bit crazy sometimes to take it on. But then just remember what I said. You don't take it on by yourself. You have a team. You have a team, you have a group of people. They've all got their own expertise, and you've got to harness that. You know, the conductor of an orchestra doesn't play every instrument. It looked very silly trying to do it all at the same time anyway. But the conductor of an orchestra understands what's going to come from each, each section of the orchestra and makes sure that they come in at the right time and they're doing the right thing. That's your job as a project manager. Plus, all those things at the top are the soft skills, if you like. Those are the things about learning about people, working with people. On top of that, you need the toolbox of hard skills. The skills that we were talking about earlier, all those tools and techniques, you need to understand them. Because nobody's going to give you a job if you can't tell them how much it's going to cost. If you can't keep to the cost, they're not going to give you a job if you say it'll be ready next month and you turn up six months later with it. So cost, time and quality are things you still have to look after. And then this is my last thought, because Victor Hugo had something which was interesting. He said, there's nothing more powerful on earth than an idea whose time has come. And for project management, I reckon that the time is now. So I think that's about me done. I hope that you found some of that interesting, something you can keep, something you remember. And if you want to talk to me about it, Afterwards, I can, if you want my email address, I'm very happy to do that. Um, have you got any questions? Or are you just so stumped? Well, uh, you said your background was uh, engineering. Yeah. Did it help in becoming a project manager? Only because the first place I turned into a project manager was in an engineering company. Um, but now I think that I have this box of skills which make me a project manager that mean I can operate in any sort of environment. The only, the only thing I would say that if you're in a, a domain that you don't personally understand, you need a technical advisor that you can trust. You need a member of your team that you can sort out whether or not they're, being, they're giving you the right story or whether they're winding you up. But for me, I just always wanted to be an engineer. That's why I moved from the Yorkshire Dales and went to university in London and then 
Oh, never got back. I, I went halfway back and ended up in Nottinghamshire, and I was going to do operational research in the Cold War. Um, that's associated with my systems engineering skills. And then my husband took a job down in the south of England, so bye-bye Nottinghamshire and the Cold Board, and I, I ended up at GC Marconi Avionics. But I think, I mean, I, I do think as an engineer. Systems thinking is my natural way of behaving. There's, a, there's a, an interesting piece of work I did with somebody called Professor John Boardman, who's now at the Stevens Institute, and he's got some very interesting ways of using systems thinking to, to provide diagrams for things, how it works. I've been talking to Robert about that, so hopefully he's going to point you in the right direction. There was a question over here. Yeah. Um, from your past experience, do you think focusing on the ion 